Well, Ron, thank you so much for joining us once again on Fully Scored. It's really, really great to speak with you. And today we're going to be looking at a tone poem from the pen of James Kernow, The Great Salvation War. So I've got a few questions, first of all, to get us to know this piece, and then we'll have a look at the score and uh, take a look at the music involved. So my first question would be, where did you first come across this piece of music? I heard the premiere of this work, 1980, in Kansas City at the Centennial National Congress of the Salvation Army in America. Jim had written it for the Salvation Army Student Fellowship Brass Band of Asbury College. At that time, in 1980, he was uh, on the music department staff, and he was the bandmaster of, of that fine band. And can you tell us a little bit about the synopsis of the story that this piece of music is trying to tell and what its inspiration in being written came from? He was intrigued by a book of his colleague, Dr. Edward McKinley, Salvation Army historian, called Marching to Glory, which was a history of the Salvation Army in America, which had come out in time for the centennial. And... Uh, Jim said this about it, I'm quoting, I endeavored to capture the spirit of early day salvationists as they gave themselves completely to the great salvation war. The phrase itself appeared in the Pacific Coast edition of the War Cry on January 1, 1888, and was often used by pioneers to describe their daily struggle against Satan and his legions. So, Jim chose three songs, I think, very much along for Jim and Ed McKinley, their favorite songs to tell the story. Stand Like the Brave, In Thee, O Lord, Do I Put My Trust, the chorus, and then, particularly for uh, Ed McKinley, The Old Rescue the Perishing. Now, those were the three songs. The piece is mostly connected around uh, Stand Like the Brave which is an old Salvation Army song. You may re recall it being used by Eric Ball very successfully in Song of Courage. In terms of the trajectory of the piece, it's very much spiritual warfare music. So the first almost two thirds of the piece are about battle, okay? Using Stand Like the Brave. And then there's the reflective middle when our hero or heroine feels in the middle of the battle, I need, I need help, Lord, in thee, O oh Lord, do I put my trust, which is just the chorus states that over and over again, it goes higher and higher. And then, of course, the ending, the last part, which is in many ways not very long, of Rescue the Perishing in augmentation, surrounded by motives derived from the Stand Like the Brave ideas. So... That, that's really what the tone poem uh, is trying to, to do. It's about standing up to face the foe. Uh, all the music is always rushing upwards. In fact, even uh, in Thee, O Lord, Do I Put My Trust, is the same phrase over and over again, up, sequentially. So the, the, it's a very positive, uplifting score uh, from that perspective. And that, that's what Jim was trying to portray. And to help us put this work into its context, whereabouts in the output of James Kernow's writing does this piece fall? Um, it comes just as Jim is being recognized as one of the finest wind band writers uh, in America. And of course, he's been writing a number of works for the Salvation Army as well. It, he's already a full endorsed professional at that time, right at the top of American uh, wind band music. Fantastic. Well, I think that would be a good point to delve into the score and look at it in some more detail, and we'll hear the excerpts played as we go through. So, I don't think there's a better place than the beginning to start. Could you tell us a little bit about this introduction and how it sets up the work? <laughs> Right from the get-go, we're in, we're in battle, okay? And there's a, a canonic response between the 
tenor trombones and the solo and first cornets, a rising line, okay? But moving slowly against that are, are the mellows and the tubas with an exciting percussion underneath it. And then in bar five, you have the same idea in diminution, okay? Going very, very fast. And those ideas uh, will be stated over and over again, along with gradually the interjection of the main motive stand like the brave, uh, which will be used very, very effectively by Jim throughout uh, this, this, this opening section. And I would say that one of the interesting things about this tone poem is its proportions. In other words, this Great Salvation War, the majority of it is about energetic warfare. So in other words, if you had to graph this, in the seven and a half minutes it takes to do this piece, a large percentage of it is the energetic opening warfare, okay? And then you have the reflective section in the O Lord do I put my trust, which is itself a rising idea up. And then of course, the, almost the tag at the end, rescue the perishing. By the way, I don't know if Jim was influenced, but the idea when he brings rescue the perishing at the end, it always reminded me of what Les Condon did in present age when suddenly we get courage, brother, you know, in the last part. At first, we're, we're kind of stunned, like, where did that Victorian hymn tune come from? Same thing here, Rescue the Perishing. But the use of it becomes very, very effective uh, in, in the last little bit of the piece. There are some dangerous things in this piece. The main thing is the key scheme. This starts out in band pitch C, B flat concert, and uh, but it ends in D flat, okay? And so we're again, we're rising up, okay? And uh, it, it's what we would call open tonality. In other words, we purposely are deciding uh, to go up. Now that's a very warm key for brass bands, D flat, but it is rife with intonational problems. So I would say those who are preparing it, careful from uh, from the, the big cadence in the middle of, in the O Lord do I put I took my trust, which goes to D flat. And then the ending section, which is in D flat major, watch out. Because, you know, the, the well, and even in A flat for the E flats, that's, those are tough keys to play in tune, okay? It can be very effective, but boy, is that, is that challenging. And when this piece was written it was, uh, in the era of Salvation Army music, there's a real emergence, or, and had been for probably about 20 years previously, of the American school of writing in Salvation Army music. Right. What do you think is it about this piece that gives it its distinctive American soundscape? Well, I think it reminds me so much of what Kurnow has absorbed in the, in the American wind band tradition, okay? Uh, whether it's people like Persichetti or others, and, and there, there's, there's, that, there's that sense of, uh, first of all, modern harmonies built in seconds and fourths, uh, parallel and uh, fanning harmonies, in other words, kind of like the spider doing the uh, push-ups on the mirror kind of writing. And uh, it, it's, it's, a ve it's a very new sound uh, very little use of traditional, uh, for lack of a better term, sentimental harmonies behind the songs, you see. Even when both when, when these songs are being used, you're not hearing them in their original context. You're hearing them in new expressive ways, whether it's the way he builds the climax to, in the O Lord, do I put my trust, or even the appearance of... Uh, the appearance of Stand Like the Brave, which, by the way, he, he, it takes a long time for him to develop until we actually hear the whole song. We hear fragments and we hear his original music based on that, but it takes a while before that to come through. But the sound, the sound is very American, okay, in that sense, which can go all the way back to Copeland, really, okay. Uh, Copeland and Barber and others from the late 30s and 40s. So I think Colonel has absorbed that sound into his own into his own writing style. 
and uh, e even Rescue the Perishing. You can't get more Victorian than that Rescue the Perishing song. But Jim frames it with reiterations of Stand Like the Brave and is able to place it almost sounds like an augmentation, but actually it should not be rushed. Uh, another, I would say, I think the score says quarter of equals 132 plus, okay, for that last section. My caution is don't go much faster than 132 because I think you'll lose the majesty of Rescue the Perishing as it sounds against all that other busy material. So I would be, I would be careful not to push the ending tempo too much on that. that that's just that, that's just my observation. But yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a new sound world. And uh, the idea of those motor rhythms and the percussion underneath it, that's an American sound, okay, that came into Army, Army music. Uh, well, it really started with what Bruce Broughton was writing in the late 60s, early 70s, and some of his works too, okay? You know, Bruce's treatment of... of um, the old Lowell Mason tune uh, when, when he wrote Covenant, okay? I mean, people think that's a, a, a modern work. That was written way back in 1970, you know what I mean? So 10 years before this one, okay? So both of those guys were very much absorbing the American symphonic sound and the American, for Jim, the American symphonic wind band sound, okay, uh, in what he wrote. And how much of that American wind band tradition do you think that we hear and see in this piece specifically? Well, quite a bit, as a matter of fact. And uh, I would say that uh, until you get to the middle section, okay, uh, it, it's, it's rife with Americanisms, is, is, is what I would say. Until you get to the O Lord, okay, and the counterline, ba da 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 da, that modal idea, that that's more traditionally can be said to be part of our own Salvation Army tradition. That I would say it's the American sound dominates it, okay, dominates it. And it was interesting when when and that piece was when that piece was uh, premiered on that same program were were pieces like Steve Bullis. Uh, a uh, suite of, of overtures about the, the four territories. Uh, there was also the <clears throat> Chicago staff band playing Eric Lightson's old songs in the heart. I mean, there was some, the old and the new. And I think why this piece captured so much of the, uh, everybody's imagination was this, for most of the people in the audience, it was a new sound, okay? For many of us growing up in that wind band tradition, it wasn't. Okay, so but but basically, uh, I would say that it was dominantly American in, it, in its approach. So going back to the score, it isn't until letter H that we first see it referenced into the score, the first iteration of the tune, Stand Like the Brave. What can you tell us about that melody? Well, we almost always hear it in just the chorus. Because remember when Eric Ball uses it in uh, song of course, he just uses stand like the brave, stand like the brave, stand like the brave with your face. Where the he just does that. But how many of us know the other words? God's trumpet is sounding to arms is to call more warriors are wanted to help on the war. My king is in the battle. He's calling for me, a salvation soldier, for Jesus I'll be. That's the verse. But we don't sing that anymore. We might sing Stand Like the Brave, maybe. Okay, a couple of old saints get their glory some Sunday night. They might, they might pull that out, you see. And uh, the same thing is true of Rescue the Perishing. I mean, that was Ed McKinley's favorite Victorian song. But again... You listen to the words, oh my goodness, a little treacly. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one. Lift up the fallen. 
tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Now, that's the verse that's being expressed. The average person would say, what on earth is that? But they might know the chorus, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. They might know that, you see. So there, there is a little bit of education going on for both the audience and even the band members these days, if you're going to go back to this piece. Now to shine a little spotlight on the next, perhaps transitional, moment of the piece. We've gone from this battle and warlike, ostinato-driven um, music that's very intense. How does Jim transition us into the very much opposite and juxtaposed in the O oh Lord throughout section M into N? Well, what he does, he uses a, a new idea, which is itself derived from the opening motive. So in letter L, the soprano cornet. And we begin to get counter lines. Da, da, de, da, da. Okay, very much a, a kernel trait. And uh, before the flugel even begins its solo at letter N, those ideas are springing out of the opening battle music. But what a change, that molto rao, three before M, okay? That idea. And uh, we can see where those ideas are coming from, but by the time the solo cornet gets a hold of it at letter M, it's something new altogether and becomes a counterline for the, uh, for th that next section. And of course, he ain't going to give up on Stand Like the Brave either, is he? He's going to bring that back in during the presentation. Um, well, I wanted to mention something at letter P that uh, f for those of you who are uh, concerned, here's where D flat first comes in solidly, okay? And watch out for the tuning. But notice the, the tempo mark. Poco piumoso and with fervor, okay? But then T-E-N building to a typical climax. If Jim were conducting, he'd stretch that to the max. I mean, almost to wish the soprano player wish he didn't, okay? And he would really, really stretch that uh, a tenuto marking going into the out tempo. But the key there is don't make a meal of it. Make sure you do a little piumoso with fervor before you start pulling it back, okay? And then the row. Because I think Jim can build layers and layers and layers. And if you've ever played under Jim, you can never quite get rich enough. He always wants a little bit more from you. Okay. So I would just caution that. But watch out for those, those flats. And before we talk about that final section, the climax, how does the use of in the O oh Lord and the selection of that tune fit in with the overall narrative of the, of the music at this stage? Well, I would say that after all the battle music, it's a reflective uh, position on the part of our hero or heroine in the middle of the battle, realizing it's not about me. It's about the Lord strengthening me through his spirit. Therefore, I must trust him in the midst of this, what I'm called to do. And, uh, and I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. And again, the idea of fully standing up to one's potential via the indwelling of the spirit in one's life. And, uh, and I, think, I think that's very, very important. 
uh, to, to bear in mind, because it's not long winded. The use of the uh, the song, it's uh, after a little of the meditative stuff. When the song finally comes in, you only really hear it once, completely. Okay, building of course to a majestic reaffirmation of faith, we would, and then we're ready. <laughs> we're ready to make sure that we are indeed going after the perishing. Okay, and as listeners or those studying this score of this music throughout section R where we have that iteration of Rescue the Perishing what are some of the things that we should be looking out for or taking note of in the music itself? Well, it's a balance issue isn't it? Because while you have the marching rhythm underneath you have the motive uh, from the first part accompanying Rescue the Perishing here's a balance issue Okay, if you're not careful, the solo cornets and the trombones, okay, on the second time through, are going to bury that tune, okay, carefully. But notice that Jim purposely lets the song sound by itself the first time, okay, and only at the forte level. Typical kerno, he's going to build and build, but the fortissimo doesn't come till S, okay. But be careful that the uh, the balance overall that is 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 carefully placed so that the uh, stand like the brave stuff doesn't get in the way too much. Although it is it is the excitement, is it not, for that whole that whole section. the piece i guess like any good beethoven symphony lots of these motifs are brought back in uh, for the coda is there anything again that we should be looking out for as musicians in the concluding section of this music well there are any number of things but uh he kind of wraps it all up at the end stand like the brave uh, rescue the perishing and augmentation and even the counterline everything is is put back at the end um uh, you know, I have a feeling that Jim purposefully condensed this last section. Maybe he was pressured to get it written so the band could learn in time for the Congress. But on the other hand, I'm glad that he didn't uh, make a protracted ending, okay? That uh, we reach the idea of our calling, that we are to rescue the perishing, and we are to stand like the brave in the midst of it. And I think, I think he states it very, very well. Uh, at, at the end, are all the ideas layering on top of each other. Uh, Molto row at the end, isn't it? Stand like the brave, rescue the perishing, and the the little uh, typical kernel, ba da 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 da, and a little modal ending, it's typical Jim. It just condenses the whole argument. You see, I th I think at the at the end, and uh, making sure that you don't overdo it too. Okay, that's all. Notice, he, he, notice, by the way, T to the end. Fortissimo, but in bar two, only forte. Okay, only forte. So that you can build to the end and so that the counter line in the altos, first baritone, euphonics can be heard, keep that forte piano down, okay, until the final note. And you pray that the boys play in tune. Fantastic. Well, Ron, thank you so much for your time, but also your expertise and that light that you've been able to shed on this magnificent piece. And thank you for joining us once again on Fully Scored. I hope that we're able to hear from you again in the future. Very pleased to do it. Enjoyed it very, very much. Thank you.